Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the May talk uh, for the journal, uh, Global Diabetes Journal Club. Um, today, we have the pleasure to have uh, Dr. Gabriela Carrillo. She's, um, she got a PhD in global health from the University of Edinburgh. And she's at the moment employed at the uh, Public Health Scotland. And her main task is uh, working on health-related data analysis. And today she will talk about uh, sex differences in diabetes and depression using Mexican data. And uh, this, I just wanted to say that this is a collaboration that started a couple of years ago as a result of, a, yeah, like a casual uh, meeting at the EDE conference in, in Denmark. And so, yeah, o over to you, Gabby. Thank you. Uh, so thanks very much. And uh, nice to meet you all. Um, I'm very happy to be here and be able to present the results. I'll start sharing my screen um, so we can all see the presentation. Um, I don't know, can anybody give me some thumbs up? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, so yeah, so today I'll be talking about this study and this study is entitled Sex Differences in Diabetes and Depression. And as Omar mentioned, these are findings from the Mexican National Health and Nutrition Survey, the 2018-19 edition. And so although I'll be presenting today, I wanted to mention as well um, my collaborators um, and this is Ju Mei Li uh, from Bielefeld University in Germany and Omar. Um, he's uh, working in Aarhus in Denmark. Um, so we started this collaboration just over a year ago. Um, and this is pretty much our uh, side project that we have um, because the data um, was available and we are very curious. Um, so yeah. Um, so this is an overview of what I'll, I will be covering today um, because we all have different backgrounds and I'm aware that most likely um, if you're not from Mex Mexico, you may not be aware of the local context. Um, so so we are, uh, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about that. So we are all on the same page and then I'll be focusing on some key elements, um, which are the objectives, population, and the measures that we used. I'll be, uh, when I describe the measures or the variables that we used, I'll be um, talking a little bit more about the Mexican context as well, so we can understand um, how these variables were created. And then I'll be moving on to the methods and the results, and I'll be finishing with the conclusion and some uh, final reflections. So first, a little bit of background. So for diabetes and depression, um, it is said that there is um, a bidirectional relationship between the both. So people with diabetes have an increased risk of developing depression, but this also happens the other way around. People with depression have an increased risk of uh, developing diabetes. So there are some fundamental causes that um, are attributed to both. And I'll be discussing a little bit uh, more about this in the next slide. Um, there are some prevalence in, uh, so differences in the prevalence by sex for both diabetes and depression. So in general, um, depression is more prevalent in women and diabetes, well, this is the tricky one because it varies a little bit more. So in Western Europe, in general um, is more prevalent in men, um, but of course this is a, not the case for every country. And uh, in Mexico, um, it's, it's, it's amongst women. So the prevalence um, in, in studies tends to be higher in women. Um, so this uh, illustration is, this is just an attempt to summarize some of the, the sheer causes or the fundamental causes of both diabetes and depression. This is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, and um, I just put it this way so we can see that they are all interlinked. And, um, and yeah, so we can start, uh, for instance, with the biological. And so there are some studies that uh, have looked at the role of hormones in the development of depression and diabetes. And some of them have focused on the 
sex hormones and how some of them like testosterone or estrogen estrogen may be related or protective factors um, for both. Um, some studies have looked at possible genetic influence um, for diabetes and depression. And there is also a little bit of the um, inflammatory responses uh, when you have depression or when you have diabetes. And there are some environment or environmental and life events uh, factors that um, have been studied. So these go from the in utero environment. And we know that there's some attention or in the last decade or a bit longer maybe, um, there's been some attention to the first uh, thousand days of life. And this is just from before we are born and um, how that early environment may have some impact later on in life and uh, how it's associated to some health outcomes. And this includes as well some adverse childhood experiences. And as its name says, um, these are some events that happen during childhood, um, which may have, uh, uh, well, they are linked to uh, chronic diseases, which include diabetes. And um, we can include as well um, poverty. Um, so poverty um, is related to, um, or can, have an impact on the um, access to healthcare. So it may reduce the access uh, to healthcare. And it also, people who live in poverty uh, may have an increased stress, uh, levels, levels of stress um, and some reduced coping mechanisms. And um, so this is, as you can start to see, it's sort of start to interlink. Um, and we can include some, uh, some, uh, other environmental aspects such as the neighborhood you live in and the levels of noise, traffic, uh, the access you have to green spaces, to food. Um, this, there, most, most of these studies um, are in relation to obesity, but there is uh, some attention to all the chronic conditions as well. And the social aspects we can include, um, the social cohesion, uh, the stigma, um, the peer support, uh, the um, violence uh, in the place you you, you live um, and for the behavioral aspects um, we have um, the adoption of un unhealthy habits and sometimes also the effects of or, or the burden of one disease um, which may have uh, or may produce like low energy uh, poor sleep unhealthy habits and lack of um, exercise or physical activity. So as we can see, it's some sort of a, a negative feedback loop, if we want to uh, call it somehow. So this is just to, to show some of the relevant um, aspects that are related to both. Um, but as I say, this is not an exhaustive uh, list. So now a little bit about the Mexican context. Um, so in Mexico, the in this survey, uh, people are asked if they have a medical diagnosis of diabetes. So that's the self-reported diabetes. And in the previous survey to the one that we took the data from, um, the prevalence of self-reported diabetes was a 9.4. And this is a steadily, uh, has been increased, uh, increasing steadily uh, during the last decades. Um, and the prevalence of depressive symptoms, this one has been sort of um, steady at 13, 15%, uh, but this prevalence of depressive symptoms is not for people with diabetes. So this is just the prevalence of depressive symptoms um, in, in, in the country. So this is the estimation. So now um, what we were set to do, uh, so the objectives and the population, so our aim was to investigate sex differences and the likelihood of depressive symptoms and diabetes. So in other words, we wanted to see the effect or to assess the effect of sex on depressive symptoms and if it's modified by diabetes. So as we can see here, our outcome was um, depressive symptoms. 
um, and you may see it through some slides that I abbreviated as DS. So how did we measure depressive symptoms? So to determine uh, depressive symptoms, we use the scale, which is the CESD7, um, and that stands for Center of Epidemiologic Studies Depression Scale. And the seven uh, means that there are seven items in that scale. The original um, scale includes 20 questions. So this is this is a shortened version of that scale, but it's been validated in the Mexican population, um, this, uh, this shortened version. And we use the score or the cutoff that, that's been validated for the Mexican population. And that's the score of uh, nine points or higher, and that's indicative of uh, depressive symptoms. Um, and the population in the study, these are adults that uh, participated in the survey. Um, these are adults of 20 years or older. And for the exposures with our sex and self-reported diabetes, we refer to this as the biological sex as, as a present in the survey. And for self-reported diabetes is um, whether the person said that they had a medical diagnosis of diabetes. Um, just an important note here is that we did not include in the count of people with diabetes. We did not include women with gestational diabetes. And that's because um, this is not necessarily a permanent condition. So we decided to exclude them from, from that analysis. And um, well, yeah, I have, I have this little link and note here. So we register um, our initial protocol um, for this study in the open science framework. And so here I have the short link if anybody would like to have a look at that. And okay, so for the measures, so these are like the variables that we included in, in the analysis and the study. So we have um, educational level and that was um, in four categories. So we have uh, known and that's when somebody indicated that they had uh, never attended any formal um, like schooling. Um, we have basic education and that was defined according to the definition of uh, the Mexican definition of basic education. And that's up to, uh, so that's primary and secondary school. Um, so would be to up to ninth grade. Um, and then we have um, the secondary schooling, which starts from year nine to 12, and then higher education from 12 and, and more like postgraduate education. We have marital status, and that was um, married or cohabiting, single, widowed, or um, divorced and separated. For the socioeconomic quintiles, this um, we created, we, we built these quintiles um, by using the principal component analysis. Uh, we don't have uh, the quintiles as such in this survey. So, but we do have some information that we used to build this index and then the quintiles. Um, and what we have is some information about um, ownership of appliances, like domestic uh, appliances. Um, we have information as well about um, access to services, um, like cable or internet, or um, if they employ someone to help them in with like the house. Um, we also have information about the materials of construction of the house, um, whether it's like um, um, bricks or blocks or so on. And for location, we um, split in rural and urban. So we defined a rural populations as those settlements with 
less than 2,500 people and um, urban is the ones with more than that. Um, we have some data about behavioral um, aspects and that um, we included uh, tobacco smoking and that's a uh, dichotomize in yes or no. So yes is um, current and no is former and never. Um, so it's similar for, for alcohol consumption. Um, we include as well um, whether the person um, had been victim of violence and this doesn't relate um, as just domestic violence, but in the survey, the question is whether in the last 12 months, also the 12 months previous to the, the survey, they had been a victim of um, robbery or like aggression or any form of violence. And we know this is important um, given the, the Mexican context and the level of security in some areas of the country, but also because as we see, um, can be an important aspect to take into account. And for disabilities, um, this included some, um, the question is not uh, exactly like that in the survey, but we built this based on other questions in which people indicated um, how easy or how difficult it is for them to do daily tasks or, or hear or see or to, um, to communicate and, and, and this, the sort of activities. We also included some um, data related to healthcare provider and diabetes. So for the healthcare provided, uh, we have these four um, four categories. So I'm just going to briefly explain this because um, this is a very particular in Mexico. So the system, the healthcare system in Mexico works in a sort of three-way uh, healthcare system um, in which we have social security, which is the one that um, people in formal um, jobs have or may have access to. Um, and it's some sort of copayment between the uh, employee, the employer, and the government. And we have the public health care, which is the one that is available for everyone, um, regardless of um, your job status or if you are in the informal market or not. Um, you just need to um, affiliate to it. We have uh, the private health care, and that's the one that I suppose we are most. Uh, like we have more like the common definition, um, which is uh, where you, you pay for the services that you um, access. And this uh, private services uh, vary in cost and facilities. And we included here all they, and this is because there is something very uh, peculiar in Mexico. So in Mexico, there are some pharmacies um, and these pharmacies have a, a consultation room adjacent to the pharmacy and people can see or speak with a GP or a doctor for um, like a very low fee or sometimes even for free as long as they buy the medications that they are prescribed in that pharmacy. And so that's uh, included in the order. And we have none because um, some people refer that they are not affiliated to any of the previous um, and, and also they don't seek uh, medical attention. So now for the diabetes related uh, measures, we have years live with diabetes and we calculated this by um, taking into account um, the their age and also uh, the age they had when they were diagnosed with diabetes. We have some information for medication for glucose control. So is whether they haven't been prescribed any medication, um, pills, insulin and insulin and pills. We have information for complications and these are the ones that are after the arrow. And we 
categorize these ones into none, one, at least one of those, and two or more. And about comorbidities, we have data for these three. And this is where they, um, they had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or high triglycerides. And we categorize this one similarly to complications. So into none, uh, one of these three, two of these three, or all of them. So now for the methods. Um, for the analysis we conducted. So the survey includes survey weights and we use this for the descriptive analysis. So we could produce the population estimates and the prevalences that I will be showing you later on. And we also conducted an interaction test um, for multiplicative or additive interactions and an unweighted multivariable adjusted logistic regression models. So we did not adjust for sex, but we stratify by sex. So we have one model for women and one for men. And all these analyses, we uh, conducted them in R. So before moving on to the prevalences and the other analyses, I just wanted to show you um, the flow chart um, and, and, and the population included in each of the analyses. So overall, we had um, data for 43,074 adults, um, and this represented 82 million people living in Mexico. So that's what you can see on your left side. Um, and, and then we, um, we have the number of people with diabetes. So obviously most of them did not report having a diagnosis of diabetes but 40,555 did. Um, however, um, some of these people didn't have all data available for um, the measures that I previously uh, presented. And um, so the number, overall number of people included in the logistic regression models are 40,413. So we have uh, 142 people without data. And we did not um, impute any data because the proportion of uh, the people with, with missing values, uh, it was about 3%, so that's negligible. And we did not um, impute data. So now we have some, uh, we have here the results. So the prevalence of diabetes. Sorry. So we have on the right side um, the numbers for men and on the other side for women. So this here in the middle um, is showing the overall prevalence um, without, without uh, stratifying by sex. So the overall prevalence of diabetes was 10.3, which if we remember the one um, in the previous survey was 9.6, I believe. So it's, it's increased. Um, and the overall prevalence of depressive symptoms is 13.6. So um, the first row, we have the number of participants and in the numbers in brackets are um, the expanded numbers. So they represented the women 45 million and men 37 million. Then we can see the, um, how um, it compares the, the, the age of the population. So um, women on average had a 44.5 years and men 43.7. And in the bottom row, we have the um, prevalence of diabetes and depression. So for women, the prevalence of diabetes is 11.4 and the prevalence of depression is 17.6. Then we have for men, uh, the prevalence of diabetes of 9.1 and the prevalence of depression of 8.8. .8. So we can already see um, just by sex some, some differences in, in, in the prevalence. So now what I'm gonna show you is something similar, slightly similar. So this is the prevalence of depressive symptoms, but this is broken down 
by uh, diabetes status and also by sex. So what we can see on the right side, so the greenish boxes are the prevalence. Um, so we can see that the lowest prevalence was in men, so that's 8.1. And the highest prevalence is, in, well, men without diabetes. And, and the highest prevalence is um, for women with diabetes, and that's uh, 28.4. But we can also see that um, the, both men and women with diabetes had um, higher prevalence of depressive symptoms compared with their counterparts without diabetes. So then this take us to, to the interaction analysis and in the table I'm, I'm showing the, the information of the interaction analysis on the likelihood of depressive symptoms. So first um, I'll like you to look at the numbers in green which we have here um, in this box. And what this is doing, this is comparing the four groups that I presented in the previous slide. Um, so the reference category is men without diabetes. And what we can see here is that women with diabetes have the highest odds of depressive symptoms. So then here in this box, um, we can see the odds ratio within sex strata. So this is quite similar. So what this, this is showing is odds ratio. So the number, the 1.46, it's um, showing us that men with diabetes have um, higher odds. And the 1.42 is showing us that men, uh, sorry, women with diabetes have higher odds. So both men and women with diabetes have higher odds of depressive symptoms. And the numbers here, at these blue ones at the bottom, um, are showing us something slightly different. Um, well, it's just because this is comparing women versus men um, within the same diabetes strata. So the 2.38, it's comparing um, women versus men without diabetes and it's showing that women have higher odds. And the 2.32 is comparing women with diabetes versus men with diabetes, so both with diabetes. And it's showing us a similar uh, results that uh, women have higher odds of depressive symptoms. So now what I want you to look at is, so the, the, the test of interaction is uh, presented at the bottom of the table, which I have, which I have circle here. Um, and this is showing this point 55 is showing that there is a positive interaction on the additive scale. And because it's higher than zero is showing that there is a positive interaction. So what it says is that the, the sum of the effect of both in women and having diabetes is larger than the individual effect of sex and diabetes status. And um, yeah, so here we move on to the results of the uh, logistic regression. I'll try to be brief here because I've realized that um, probably this wasn't the best way to, to present it because it's a, it might be a bit overwhelming to have all these numbers in one slide. And this is not the full table I have. To, um, I, I split into, into three so we can see it clearly. But anyway, um, so the numbers in bold are the ones that are statistically significant. And we have a column for women and a column for men. Um, so just to see the results side by side. And this is a fully adjusted model. Um, so this first bit of the table is showing the uh, sociodemographic variables. And what we can see here for women is um, that there is some sort of um, socioeconomic gradient. So the lower the 
um, socioeconomic quintile, the higher the odds for depressive symptoms. And also we can see um, that for, for marital status, single women uh, had showed a higher odds for depressive symptoms. Whereas for men, um, we see only that the lowest income quintile, uh, sorry, socioeconomic quintile um, was associated with higher odds. And um, for men as well, the educational level like secondary schooling um, was associated with um, higher odds of depressive symptoms. So here um, we have some behavioral um, variables. And for women, we can see that smoking and having a disability um, were associated with increased odds of depressive symptoms. And for men, um, having any disability, but also um, being a, having been victim of violence in the previous year were associated with increased, uh, with higher odds of depressive symptoms. And here, this uh, last bit of the table, we have the diabetes related uh, variables. And what we can see here for women is that um, those who were on pills only for glucose control, um, the, it shows reduced odds of depressive symptoms, so somehow um, protective. And, and the number of comorbidities, having at least one comorbidity um, was associated with increased odds. So the more comorbidities they had, um, the odds increased. And similarly for number of complications. So having at least one complication um, was associated with um, odds of depressive symptoms. Um, and for men, we can see that um, years living with diabetes, those in the category of five to nine years um, living with diabetes show uh, reduced odds of, for depressive symptoms. And so some how protective. And in the number of complications, we see that having at least one complication increase the odds of depressive symptoms, but having more obviously increase the odds um, a little bit more as well. Um, so the conclusion is that about one quarter of people with diabetes, um, so I didn't present you this before, that's why I put the number in brackets, that is 23.3% uh, um, had depressive symptoms. However, we see some differences in the prevalence um, by sex. So the prevalence was higher for women but also women had women with diabetes had the greatest odds of depressive symptoms. And as I show in the interaction table, um, there was a positive interaction on the additive scale. And this additive scale um, is usually referred to as the one that is the most important for uh, public health um, because we it can help us at, at, to identify groups that um, required attention. And something that I put here in, oh, I, I highlighted, well not highlighted this in blue, um, is that sex and individual context are important. So if we are to take one, uh, what our take home message today would be that, that um, we need to move on, move away from that one size fits all and to take into account and to acknowledge that there are differences by sex, um, but also not, not only the differences by sex, within sex, individual context matter. Um, so for women, we saw that having somehow a more complex diabetes and some um, socioeconomic aspects are important. And for men, the, the, we have the, the violence and the uh, schooling. So it, it's just highlighting that, that um, tailor care, it's important. And, and, and also um, we know that um, people with diabetes have increased odds for depressive symptoms. And I think this is important that um, to also acknowledge the 
co-occurrence of both diabetes and depressive symptoms, particularly because in the Mexican um, guidelines for diabetes care, um, the official guideline doesn't include um, or doesn't recommend an assessment of mental health, um, which would be important to have. And just to finalize, I have some uh, reflections. Well, actually, the first one would be more like a note of uh, caution because we use cross-sectional data. And of course, we cannot infer uh, causality with this analysis. And we, we were not able to differentiate between type 1, 2, or, or type 1 and type, one, a type 2 diabetes um, because this is not part of the questioning. And um, we, we, we included anybody who reported having a, a, a diagnosis of diabetes. Also, we didn't include some clinical variables that could have been important to have. Um, so HbA1c is not available for everyone in the survey. So this was um, randomly taken. Um, and BMI, we, we if we uh, look at the data available, this is only available for um, like a low proportion of people. Um, but on the bright side, we, we use na uh, nationally representative data and we also use the survey weights um, to produce the population estimates. And we use the um, CSD7, which has been validated in the Mexican population. And not only that, we also use the cutoff that's being validated in the Mexican population. And so, yeah, now um, I'll happy to take any comments or questions or any sort of feedback. Um, I've added there my email just in case anybody wants to reach out and just to say hi and a link to LinkedIn if anybody wanted to connect um, there as well. I'm not the most active, but I'll, I'll, I'll check from time to time. Um, so yeah, that's all for me. Yeah.